Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvia Wu, and I'm serving as Vice Chair for the Student Association of Assist from San Jose State University. Welcome to AI in Libraries. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it is really an honor and a privilege to have all of you and our special guest tonight. We are very appreciative of your time and to be with us in this informal get together. First, I would like to talk about our organization. So what is ASSIST? ASSIST is the Association for Information Science and Technology. And what sets us apart from other organizations is that ASSIST is the organization that focuses on technology, information science, and research. Here in the San Jose State University student chapter of ASSIST, we all come from different backgrounds with a common purpose which is looking for ways to connect with one another, learn and practice our professional skills. And now I'll pass it to Lauren. Hi, so there are a lot of things that you can do with an ASSIST membership. Um, if you choose to be a member and you wanna be on the executive committee, you can gain leadership skills. It helps with the e-portfolio. You can connect with other students like we've been able to do with each other, like me and Sylvia and Kari and Ariel. Um, you can participate in meetings um, and get to know students like all of you. You get to um, get a little insight on opportunities, especially ones that are particular to the ASSIST community. Um, you get special interest groups, which focus on particular things. You get to go to conferences. Um, I know the one in the assist one next year is in Utah, Salt Lake City. So that's pretty fun. Um, you can get published, you can get publishing sent to your house. Um, also, you can attend all sorts of lectures. So if you're interested in attending any AI lectures from professionals around the world, uh, if you're a member of assist, you can go for free. Hello everyone, my name is Ariel Lomax and I am the chair of SJSU Assist Student Chapter. A few months ago, I went to a seminar called Artificial Intelligence, The Future is Already Here. I was fascinated by the potential for AI in libraries and I was surprised hardly anyone attending have any knowledge of it. Little did I know, right under our roof at SJSU, we have an acclaimed AI and machine learning specialist in our presence in the faculty of SJSU. I was nervous to reach out, but she was kind and enthusiastic to speak about AI in libraries this month for ASSIST. Andromeda Yelton is a software engineer and librarian investigating humanistic applications of machine learning. An adjunct faculty member at SJSU School of Information and in the past, she has written code for the Berkman Klein Center, the MIT Libraries, the Wikimedia Foundation, Bespoke Knitting Patterns, and Library Space Usage Analytics, among other things. Previously, she was a jack of all trades at the open license ebook startup on Gluit, taught Latin to middle school boys, and was a member of the ADA Initiative Advisory Board. She has a BS in mathematics from Harvey Mudd College, an MA in classics from Tufts and an MLS from Simmons. She's been a 2011 ALA Emerging Leader, President of the Library and Information Technology Association or LIDA and a listener contestant on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And now I am proud to introduce our guest speaker, Andromeda Yelton. Anyway, hi, I'm Andromeda. Um, normally I'm better with time, but I don't even know where my phone is anymore. Um, anyway, I am a librarian and a software engineer. I've worked at the Berkman Klein Center, the MIT Libraries, the Wikimedia Foundation, and other library-ish places, um, as well as being adjunct faculty here. And I uh, used to be president of the Library and Information Technology Association, which was a division of ALA, but uh, has now merged with several other divisions to form CORE. And I'm going to give you sort of a whirlwind tour of machine learning and hopefully still have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, so machine learning, let me tell you a little bit about how it works. 
Uh, machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed, according to the Coursera Introduction to Machine Learning, which is actually quite good. Um, and I put an asterisk on science because it's also kind of an art. There's a lot of um, sort of check, see if it works, edit it, as opposed to sort of being able to predict from first principles what your machine learning system ought to, to be like. Um, but in very broad strokes, what you do is you write a program that lets a computer read in a data set and generate predictions about new data of that type. So for instance, it might read in a whole data set of email, some of which is labeled as spam and not versus not spam, and be able to predict in future whether new emails that it sees are spam or not spam. Um, or you, you might have a bunch of photos and it is able to predict, is this one a cat photo or not a cat photo? This is actually like a real computer science homework kind of problem thing. Um, or you might have a bunch of books and it might say, hey, you liked these books. Let's make a prediction as to what other books you might like. This is all a lot of math. I'm going to give you a really conceptual overview of how that works. So let's say you wanted to write a system that made predictions about castles. Uh, first, you would gather a lot of data about castles. Uh, depending on what kind of system you were writing, maybe you want to get a lot of pictures of castles and try to recognize whether other things are castles or sort of make up your own castles. Or maybe you have a bunch of floor plans or a bunch of text that describes castles. It doesn't really matter what kind of data you have, uh, although it will generally be like the same type of data. So you teach your system about castles and you, you build a model. Uh, your model is just uh, some equations, but again, we'll leave the details aside. Um, but you build a little model of what castles are, or you use a pre-built model that someone else has made. Your model is wrong. It'll have simplifying assumptions. It'll leave out a lot of data. It may be like incredibly wrong, whatever. That's fine because you will measure how wrong you are. So in the cat photos case, you might measure, you know, what percent of photos did you erroneously label as cats that were actually like skateboards? And what percentage um, did you not label as cats that actually were? So you'll measure how wrong you are, and then you'll tweak all the parameters in your equations a bit to be a little bit less wrong next time. And when I say you, I actually mean the computer. Uh, the learning process is the computer sort of updating all of the little values in its equations to be a little bit less wrong next time. It does this on its own. Um, you're, you're just kind of there and you wait until it's done and you see if it's any good. And when you go through this process of being less wrong over and over and over, the hope is eventually uh, your model will converge on something that's pretty good at dealing with your data set. Um, I say hopefully you may fail. I have a project I'm working on where I'm trying to get better at identifying people in archival photos, and I've taken a perfectly innocent off-the-shelf neural net that was doing about like 40% on my initial data set, and I have retrained it to do about 5% uh, accuracy. So sometimes, uh, sometimes you have chosen the wrong parameters for your system and this does not work. But often it's spookily effective. So when you have hopefully a halfway decent machine learning system, what can you do with it? I'm gonna give you like a brief handful of examples in library services. Um, there are so many more. Some of them are real things that you can use today. Uh, some of them are pilot projects that you may be able to try out. Um, some of them are pilot projects that haven't been deployed. You might be able to find a write-up of them or some code, but they're not things you can interact with really. Um, some have had really high quality results. Some have been disappointing. I think they all point in directions that could be useful uh, given enough support and investment and time. So let me give you some examples of machine learning in libraries. Uh, so you can use it for cataloging. Uh, so anf.org is a project run by the National Library of Finland. And if you go to anf.org, you'll literally see this uh, website uh, that you're seeing here. And you can copy text into it. So I copied in some text from an article about Mark by Henriette Avram. 
and you can pick one of the different vocabularies it's trained its system on and it'll give you suggestions as to what some possible subjects for that text might be. And in this case we can actually see that its top choices, things like data systems and information technology, or at least in the right ballpark, like they definitely are relevant to a paper about developing the MARC record format for computers. Um, although they're not like as specific as you might hope, a lot of things would fall under that header. And also we see that Finland is one of the suggestions and that's clearly wrong. So I think at this point, text cataloging isn't necessarily at the point where you could like use it reliably and effectively. Um, but I can imagine in the pretty near future, a, a system where um, you could use it as kind of like a robot sidekick, where you have uh, computers making suggestions as to possible uh, tags or headers that a human can then evaluate and quickly accept, quickly reject, or modify, and that might um, add to efficiency, make it possible to catalog more stuff in less time. Um, another example is uh, the teeny week of play, which inspired some of my uh, neural net retraining that I was just talking about and having terrible luck with. Um, but the Charles Teeny Harris collection is at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh. He was a photographer who took lots of photos of black life in Pittsburgh um, in the sort of early middle of the last century. And so they have like 70,000 of these, which means that it's just kind of too much to really get a handle on as a cataloger. Um, and they wanted to find out, among other things, um, could we find photos that are of the same person? And so they, they used a couple of machine learning systems, one of which does face detection, and that's that green mm -hmm. box you see around these faces. It's a, a machine learning system that finds things that look like faces. Um, and then another one to um, do some face recognition uh, to compare and see if it could find the same people. It doesn't know who they are, but it's looking for same versus not same. Um, and they did find some examples like this one of the same person in totally different photos, um, but they also had a lot of errors. It was definitely something that needed a lot of uh, human oversight, um, but at least makes it possible to find the same people in a collection this large, where it may not have been possible at all before. Um, Another example of the use of machine learning in a library or cultural heritage setting is this uh, project. I don't know if they pronounce it transcribus or transcribus, um, but it's, it's a European Union project that transcribes handwritten documents. And so let me sort of give you an example. Uh, you can sign up for a free account on this and it get, it'll get you up and running pretty quickly. And this is one of its sample documents. Um, there's also versions that you can host yourself and sort of retrain their network for your own documents. But the out of the box version is pretty good. And so uh, you can see that it goes sort of line by line and it matches up lines in the handwritten text with lines in the uh, OCR text, the transcribed text. And so that makes it possible to do all sorts of other forms of scholarship on this text. It makes it possible to do a full text search, for instance, which you can't really do until you convert it into a text format computers can read. Um, you can see it's not perfect. For instance, there's this 11 in the middle of the screen where it should have had a close quote um, there's a word Claire, C-L-E-R-H, which is clearly meant to be clerk. So again, as with many of these systems, it requires a bit of human oversight to be really high quality. Um, but it's pretty good out of the box. It's definitely something where uh, you could throw full text search at it and at least have like a decent chance of finding what you were looking for. And where the human effort required would be much more like cleanup than transcription. Um, let's see, uh, another thing is Hamlet. Uh, I like this because I wrote it, um, hamlet.andromedayelton.com. And what you're looking at here is about 43,000 uh, graduate theses from MIT that are arranged according to how conceptually similar they are. So each dot in here is a thesis, and they are closer together or farther apart 
based on whether their meanings are similar or different. And that similar or different is a thing that the computer determined solely on its own, um, not with any of my input. Um, the colors represent departments, so I took that from traditional metadata. Um, but the traditional metadata that was available for this collection was very limited because it's, a, it's an institutional repository. And so it has things like title and author and department and date, but it doesn't have things like subject. It has some author supplied keywords, but they're super useless because most of them apply to only one or if you're really lucky, two theses. Um, and departments aren't great as subject access metadata either, because if you look at something like the electrical engineering and computer science department at MIT, there's thousands of theses in it. Um, so you can't really co-locate them usefully. There's just too many. And a lot of them don't really have much in common with each other. You know, an electrical engineering thesis may be very similar to like something from mechanical engineering, whereas a computer science thesis might be much closer to math. Um, so I wondered, you know, how can we make this collection explorable and discoverable? And I thought that being able to arrange things closer together or farther apart in, in concept space would be one way to do that. Um, because it would give you visual options like this, and you could also search for things like, well, I like this thesis, tell me the 10 most similar ones, maybe they are also relevant to my research needs. Um, and I, I, I had a lot of fun with this because I discovered that, that there's a lot of cool stories you can find in here. Um, so for instance, the number one place up in the top of the island, uh, you may be able to see, unfortunately, like I didn't really understand how to control the colors. So some of them are hard to distinguish, but you may be able to see there is sort of an orangey side and a more red orange side near that number one at the top of this slide. And it turns out that the red slide it, or the red dots are the biology department and the orange dots are the chemistry department. And again, it just kind of figured out that departments should, broadly speaking, go together, and that biology and chemistry are kind of close together. Um, whereas, you know, a department like math or linguistics is much less similar to either of those. So it, it successfully realized that they belong together. Um, and you may or may not be able to see, because this, this is pretty small at uh, uh, this level of Zoom, but there's a little bit of yellow mixed in in that red orange area that turns out to be the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Only a little bit of it, most of it is somewhere else. Um, but it turns out those are electrical engineering theses that all have to do with applying computational methods to biochemistry problems. And so Hamlet realized that they should be there. So anyway, Visualization and discovery based on neural nets, I think there's a lot of options there, and especially in places where we don't have traditional metadata and it's not realistic that we're going to get traditional metadata because like nobody is going to catalog their backlog of 43,000 theses. Like it's, it's literally never going to happen. Um, so I'm excited by the possibilities of computers to make that content explorable. Um, what else? There is another visualization and discovery thing, PixPlot. Um, this is similar in that it looks for similarities between different documents, but in its case, instead of looking at the text of documents, it's looking at photographs. And so it finds photographs that it thinks are similar and groups them together or spreads them apart based on that level of similarity. And this is a software library produced by the Yale Digital Humanities Lab. And so this is where they've applied it to one of their collections, but anyone could use it. So they found groups that humans have gone after and labeled as, you know, buildings or boxers or buttons or chairs. And then you can zoom in, you zoom in on buildings, and this is all the photos in here. As you zoom closer, you see they're like, they're all buildings. Um, and in fact, they're sort of squarier buildings to one side and buildings with more like triangular elements or I don't have architectural words, but like fancier looking buildings are, are closer to my left here. So it's even kind of separating buildings within that cluster by different shapes of buildings. 
And then if we go sort of far away to a totally different part of the image, we'll discover that we don't see buildings there. If we uh, zoom in all the way over here, totally different place, suddenly it's a bunch of people hanging out there in their fancy dresses and what have you. Um, so it has successfully put similar things with each other, but also far away from, from less similar things and given you a way to explore a large collection of photographs that's um, a similar kind of thing to how uh, we could explore large collections of text with Hamlet. Uh, and one last project. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this when I play it, so I will make sure that you get the link because this is super fun. Uh, this guy, Brian Fu, who has been an innovator in residence at the New York Public Library and at the Library of Congress, has done a lot of incredibly creative digital work. Um, and this is the Citizen DJ project that he did with the Library of Congress. So he has a machine learning toolkit that uh, strips out samples from audio and visual data. And he's taken all those samples uh, from public domain audio materials and put them in like in this citizen DJ project where um, it'll suggest for you some samples and some drum patterns and you can play around with it and change it and make something that totally slaps. Um, again, I'll make sure you have that link because you should absolutely like, lose lots of time playing with it, but hopefully you can hear this. I can hear it. Excellent. Because I spent like way more time than I should probably admit um, playing with this to make samples for machine learning presentations. Um, it's super fun. I will, again, I'll totally give you the link. Um, so machine learning has a lot of really fun possibilities for making collections discoverable and available uh, in places where human cataloging labor is not available or where the size of the collection is just prohibitively gigantic. Um, and for making materials available in sort of traditional ways, like applying metadata, but also in really novel and creative ways, like letting you make your own hip hop with public domain Hungarian rag from 1914. Um, so that is great, but like, what if we shouldn't? Because there are some caveats with machine learning that I definitely want you to be aware of. So a non-exhaustive list of lurking horrors in machine learning. Uh, there are more, and this is a very quick trip through them, but one, data is bad. Um, so here's some examples from a data set that, that my town of Somerville, Massachusetts has available. It, it did a happiness survey every other year from like 2011 through 2019. And so one of its questions was, you know, how satisfied are you with Somerville as a place to live? And there's a scale of one to 10 and like so far so good. There were 145 people who responded with one and uh, 1200 some people who responded with 10 and various numbers in between and, and great. And if you keep looking through the data set, you see things like six and a half, which nobody responded, but is still like in there, seven and a half, 999 on a scale of one to 10. I mean, I like my town, it's really good, but I, it's not like 999 on a scale of one to 10 good. Um, the average for this data set ends up being 42, which is like a weird average for numbers that are supposed to be between zero and 10, one and 10. Um, data is like this in the real world. It's full of omissions and errors, typos, forms that didn't validate and let people enter like weird things. Data is just bad. And so when you're feeding lots of data to your machine learning system so that it can learn, sometimes it just like learns typos and it's really unhelpful. Um, what else? Data, data is really bad. Cause like sometimes the problem is typos which is just annoying. But sometimes the problem is if you say, do a Google image search for beautiful woman, basically everyone you will find is young, white, able-bodied, et cetera, et cetera. And while this may be a correct description of women who get modeling contracts, it's not really a correct description of beauty. Um, it excludes a lot of people. It makes a lot of people feel bad. It doesn't necessarily agree with what you personally find beautiful. It's kind of narrow. Um, but unfortunately, data that's super biased in terms of gender or race or whatever else you have out there, um, there's a lot of such data sets out there and machine learning systems get trained on those data sets 
and they learn those biases. And this is a this is a widespread and well documented problem with a lot of machine learning systems. Um, there are ways to avoid it, but you have to like try. <laughs> Not everyone does. Um, and and this results in things like uh, like this. Um, you may or may not have been paying attention to this part of the internet in 2016, but uh, Microsoft made like a chat bot for Twitter. Her name was Tay. She was supposed to have the persona of like a 19 year old girl and she was like perky and she was stoked to meet you. And she learned from things that you told her. She learned from conversation. She got smarter by talking to humans. I don't know if y'all have met humans on Twitter. Uh, but if you have humans on the internet and you tell them that their chat bot will learn from the things that you say, um, they had to shut down Tay within 24 hours. Um, I, I like, I can't even show you the screenshots of the stuff Tay was saying after that time because they're just, they're really like not appropriate for a presentation or a class setting. Um, but this is just like, this is Twitter, right? Like we all know Twitter can be a garbage fire, but it is not the real world, right? Yes, no, well. Um, see, the thing is data comes from the real world. Sometimes data comes from bad places. Data maybe comes from security cameras or website tracking. And uh, those are things that happen in places maybe they shouldn't, like a lot of library websites. And they are also things that have a disproportionate effect on marginalized people who are more likely to be surveilled. So data comes from bad places. And, um, and we don't really understand what happens to it after it gets into the machine. Like there are all these potential problems with the data and then we throw it into a whole bunch of math that I, I like went over kind of at a very high level in the first few slides because I don't want to get into linear algebra and stuff. But the thing is, even if I did get into linear algebra and stuff, even as someone who trains machine learning systems, I can't tell you why they make the decisions that they do. Um, I can't tell you why I make the decisions I do either. Like I can't trace out like what's happening with all my neurotransmitters and what that means for like why I say the words I say. So maybe it's okay that we don't understand machines, but like we don't understand them. They make decisions and we cannot explain why these outputs resulted from these inputs reliably. Um, there are some machine learning systems that are like easier to explain than others. There are certainly techniques people can use to be explainable, but, uh, and sometimes there's nothing sinister about this. Sometimes it's actually just hilarious because machines make these unpredictable decisions in ways that are, are delightful. Um, but sometimes it's actually really bad because sometimes, um, sometimes we use that data in ways that we should not. We're like, oh, hey, we can build say, a machine learning system that predicts whether or not we should let people out on bail. But does that mean that we should? Um, certainly a number of people have and a number of jurisdictions use these proprietary machine learning systems to make decisions about things like bail or parole or where to send police. Um, and that means we have machine learning systems where, where the public can't audit the data or the algorithms, even though they're being used for a public purpose, uh, where we don't necessarily understand why they make the decisions that they make. Um, and in a context where we know that machine learning systems frequently exhibit, for instance, racial bias. Um, so sometimes machine learning is bad and you should not use it. And we do anyway. So that is my like super quick uh, stroll through machine learning. Um, if you want to learn a little more, I still have a bit of time for questions. If you want to learn a lot more, I will be teaching this in the fall. It is an eight week half course uh, info 28710, I think is the uh, the number at the end of it this time. But anyway, Info 287, the one taught by me, 
this fall. Um, if you want to learn all about this, we can spend eight weeks. And luckily, it's an asynchronous course. So the fact that I have no idea what time it is is not a problem. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that we can have a bit of Q&A. Yes, thank you. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. We still have some time for questions. OK, so I just want to know if you won on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. I did. And I was really psyched because I, I had literally no idea what to get my husband because he's really hard to shop for. And I'm like, what might he want that he doesn't have? And I'm like, Carl Castle's voice on his answering machine. And I had no other ideas. And that was like December 20th. So <laughs> Carl Castle's voice on your answering machine. That is like the perfect <laughs> gift. <laughs> awesome. Okay, hey, any other questions? Okay, I'll ask a question then. <laughs> um, what steps are being taken to tackle bias in machine learning? Or, oh or, or, or are there steps being taken? There are. Uh, this is a huge and contentious question. Um, there, there are like whole conferences, like multiple conferences that are dedicated to this question. Um, oh my gosh, I literally in one of my like open tabs right now, have this um uh the th blog post i just uh pasted in it's basically what they do is they look at a whole bunch of words um that might have particular kinds of bias associated with them and they they tweak the math in their system a bit to remove that bias from places it should not exist so let me get a specific example um so in terms of gender bias, for instance, there are words like father and mother that have gendered associations that are correct. Like, like the, the meaning of those words, in fact, encompasses a certain amount of gender. And it's okay if they are associated with words like man and woman to an extent. Um, but then there's words like, you know, singer or shopkeeper. Uh, that really shouldn't have any gender association, but that might come out of your system having a gender association um, just because it has learned bias from its corpus of data. So they generate a bunch of, of words or word pairs um, that they think, you know, should or should not have particular kinds of bias and update the, the math of their system a bit so that the ones that, that shouldn't have gender bias um, don't end up being correlated or don't end up being strongly correlated with words like male or female. And they do a similar process with other types of bias. Um, there's also great decisions like not using a machine learning system at all in places where you shouldn't. <laughs> so um, for instance, there's campaigns to ban government use of facial recognition in a number of jurisdictions, including mine. Like Somerville was one of the first places to do that. Um, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> Not as much as there should be. There are plenty of people who do not care, but there's a lot. It's good to know there are some people who care. <laughs> there are some, yes. What can, um, tell, what can you tell us about the acceptance of um, AI, the concept of AI in libraries, and how is that progressing? So the experience I've been having over the last few years is that libraries are really interested in AI, sort of in the same way that libraries are frequently interested in any new technology trend, where like, they hear it's new hotness, and they want to know about it, but they don't necessarily know what to do with it, or how to support AI projects. So like, I definitely see a group of like software engineers who are trying to learn some stuff about AI, and a group of managers who are trying to figure out what can they do with AI, and, and what does it take to support an AI project. Um, but relatively few people who are actually doing stuff with it, like the Library of Congress, um, chiefly through, uh, LC Labs. Oh, I said I'd give you Citizen DJ, so I'm going to give you Citizen DJ. Um, Stanford is doing some stuff. Um, a lot of the national libraries in Scandinavia, like most of the AI stuff I know about in libraries is in Scandinavia. Um, there's not a huge amount. There's a lot of interest. There's not a lot of actual, like, stuff, stuff. Um, 
Um, do you have any AI technologies that you think libraries should invest in or that you think are interesting for libraries? And on the same vein, um, like you said, that there are some machine learning things that we shouldn't do. Are there any things that you're worried about? Um, maybe like I can think of like maybe some security or privacy concerns um, when it comes to things that like interest or excite you. Uh, let's see. So should uh, I'm trying to work on like making a company that provides AI services to libraries. So once I figure out what those services are, I think they should invest in those, but I don't know what they are yet. Um, I think that, like I said, I think AI is really good for places that it's hard for cataloging labor to reach. So I think um, special collections, like any place their libraries have like you data that's unique and valuable to the institution um but that is for whatever reason hard to fully catalog i think there's opportunities to make that more discoverable with ai and i think there's a lot of opportunity for using ai as like a robot sidekick to make cataloging more efficient mm -hmm. um in, in both libraries and archives i've definitely seen some cool stuff with archives uh, places libraries shouldn't. Uh, I would be very wary of anything that's trained on patron data. Um, AI systems, even though it's like a whole bunch of impenetrable math, they tend to leak. Um, they're they're not they're very hard to secure in part because we have no idea what's going on. Um, so anything that's trained on patron data can inadvertently release that data, and I would not want to be doing that. Um, and then I think libraries need to have a lot of awareness of the bias that goes into the systems. There's, there's a really good uh, book, uh, Mask, Masked by Trust by Matthew Reedsma, who wrote about bias in library discovery systems. And it's, it's not just about AI, but um, it's very applicable to AI. And I think libraries need to be really aware that, you know, if, if your AI has like learned to be racist, that's, and you're using it for like reader's advisory or discovery, um, it's maybe gonna be pushing your patrons in particular directions, which I mean, is that worse than where library staff are pushing people? Maybe, maybe not, you know, library staff are not always shining in this department either, but it's really important to be aware of, of these possibilities and like, to ask vendors really pointed questions as to what they're doing to mitigate them. Yeah, the data leaks are something that's really concerning. Like we feel like every other week we hear about some sort of data leak and yeah. definitely don't want people to like not feel comfortable using the library and the resources out of fear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I like to avoid letting libraries learn on patron data. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are there any other questions? You actually answered my other two questions by answering her question. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I forgot what I was going to ask. Well, you're like the expert because you took my class. So. <laughs> well, you know, I may have uh, said something to uh, somebody here to uh, somebody. <laughs> somebody. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, no, no, not a problem. Um, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Actually, uh, compared to most librarians, you you are. It turns out. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It turns <laughs> out. Um, no, uh, it, it's funny. My roommate is actually taking data science classes on Coursera from I think mm -hmm. IBM, and I was got I got very excited because I was like, I know what that is. <laughs> I I know what that is. I could I. I that is gross and dirty and um oh yeah, that's what i was gonna ask oh <laughs> uh, so say if you do have machine learning um that may or may not have patient records mm -hmm. um would patron privacy bills and patron privacy acts cover that? That is an amazing question that I don't think I am qualified to answer, but I, that I think I, wish I need to have to ask some of my lawyer friends. Because I'm taking another class and we we're talking about privacy and ethical issues. And um, I know here in New Jersey, mm -hmm. there 
is well not about robots or machine learning but like we have a like particular thing saying we can't give out any information unless we have a warrant and mm -hmm. on that our library systems don't keep any information on what the patron takes out right uh we don't know their passwords we don't know what they check out we don't keep the system gets wiped every night more or less you have so they can't even say who i looked up mm -hmm. yesterday or who i helped yesterday um so i was just curious if that would be yeah just thinking out loud because if that's the case then you don't necessarily have to worry about leakage well i mean i think you have to worry regardless because you know things can be illegal and still happen <laughs> like the, well, yeah. the data is out there i don't know i'm going to ask people on twitter and uh <laughs> you can read the replies to whatever they say you okay. know a lot of cyber lawyers i'm sure it depends a lot on the jurisdiction right like as you know new jersey has its specific laws and, and different states are different i i don't know but if you think about like your um like predictive text on your phone or something like that works by learning when people have just typed these words a word that they're likely to type next is whatever and so you can imagine a data system learning you know that that after the words andromeda yelton social security number the next block of text is you know numbers i am not about to say and you would like really not want that data to be releasable through your system you know and i i, I I feel like that might be a problem regardless of the laws, but I don't know what the laws say. Um, that's a really good question. I'm going to ask people. Um, I can, by the way, stick around, especially because you all showed up when I was supposed to and did not. Um, I'm sure that other people have like plans for uh, for six, but if there's like other Q and A people have, I'm happy to stick around for a bit. Yes. Any other questions? I had one question about, um, how do I say this? Uh, machine learning and images. Uh, mm -hmm. I was doing research and um, like, I'm interested more so in art librarianship, but I thought in my research, I found it interesting. They use machine learning to like, say like match someone's x-ray with a condition, mm -hmm. like the image is looking alike. Are there any other ways that, um, or possibilities that it's being used like that, that um, could be helpful? So there were in fact two awesome presentations last semester on art, data, and AI in my class that covered all kinds of stuff I had never heard of before. So now I'm trying to remember what my students told me about uh, last term, but um, there are definitely people who use AI to try to identify art styles and art forgeries. Um, there are people who use AI to try to figure out um, what might have been like on the canvas before, because you know people paint over canvases. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I've seen there's a recent paper, as actually someone from MIT Libraries was co-author on, where they had um, like documents that were still folded up inside of sealed envelopes, and they use like X-rays and AI to reconstruct the text of those documents. So you have this really like non-destructive way to figure out um, what's going on um, in your material. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a ton of art stuff, and there's some really interesting data co collections for art because lots of museums have been released, like the Rijks Museum. The Art Institute of Chicago, like there's really cool art data sets out there. Nice. Thank you. Go on, Kitty. All right. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. And I just want to explain for people who don't know, Kelly was the one who told me about Andromeda because we were at the, uh, we were at the uh, AI seminar together and we were the only ones that were excited. <laughs> Like everyone else was terrified and was like, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, I basically like was in the whole chat being like, no, this is really cool. I'm learning about this, blah, blah, blah. And then, lo and behold. We were the only ones who thought it was cool. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought this is, I thought this is definitely something that um, 
students need to know more about, especially students interested in things like ACES who are interested yeah. in like the science aspect of information technology. And especially, uh, especially because you have your class. So, so they know that the class is in the fall, every, every fall, correct? Uh, so I, I actually see is the class offered every semester. Uh, the class is offered when they ask me to offer it. Although this has, in fact, this was fall. It, it isn't this semester, but it was last spring, last fall, and next fall. So every semester, no. Uh, frequently, apparently, yes. Uh, but I, I don't know what their long-term plans are. <laughs> they ask me if I will do it. I say yes. I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. So just, it's definitely in this fall. It's so. definitely in this fall. I cannot make you any promises about after that. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Sylvia, I think we can share Yeah, thank again. you. Again, I'm really sorry to like having That's wasted okay. 15 minutes of everyone's time. It was fascinating. I'm glad I got to hang out with you anyway. Yeah, it was fascinating. <laughs> Very exciting. I, I hope everyone had a great time. Okay, Sylvia, take it away. Well, I, I would just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. And here, actually, the, the next slide it says questions and answers. So, um, again, um, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate of your time. And uh, Dr. Yelton, thank you so much for joining us and be part of this great event. And hope you can join us in the, in the future events that we have. Okay, yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope to hang out with us after more conversation, after the recording ends. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>